This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Wesley Marks, author of The Frail Ocean, speaks on the topic, Can the Ocean Survive Us? Mr. Marks. The shore has often been seen as the dividing line between the uh, forces on the land and the forces in the ocean. While the land has been intensively developed both as an agricultural and industrial resource, the ocean has traditionally been seen as somewhat of an impenetrable readout of nature. In fact, when our writers and our musicians and our painters have been looking for a setting that connotates power, mystery, and beauty, they've often used the ocean as their setting. However, it's been one of the burdens of our times that while we are perhaps looking at a painting by Homer or hearing La Mer or reading Stevenson or Conrad, that the next moment to turn to the newspaper and find out that the ocean is being revealed more for its weaknesses and its strengths at this time. In fact, the traditional notions that have held uh, such a sway for such a long time as the ocean is an all-powerful mechanism still continue on oceanographic ships. Here's a cruise going across the equator and it's a traditional ceremony in which the seamen who are crossing for the first time have to propitiate the sea gods. And here you have one of the crewmen kissing the belly of one of Neptune's assistants. However, at this time, the ocean is really being revealed in far different ways. In fact, the shore is not so much a dividing place as a meeting place for natural forces and social forces that extend far offshore and far inland. And when these forces are unbalanced, the implications extend far inland and far offshore. Here you have a shot of Newport Beach in California. And this is a shot that you normally don't see in Holiday or Surfing Magazine. It's a shot when the beach has actually vanished and gone and left the vacationing public stranded. Here you have a picture of the uh, lifeguard station at Newport Beach with the admonition, please no sandy feet. At the same time, this lifeguard station is undergoing its own case of beach erosion, and the worry here is that there not, may not even be any sand for the lifeguard station, much less sandy feet. At the same time that the recreation is uh, usurped in beach erosion, you have a property threatened. The sandy shore is uniquely set up to withstand the brunt of hurricanes and storm tides, Yet when the beach vanishes, the property must absorb the punishment of the ocean. When this occurs, sort of a brute force type of engineering approach often comes into play. This is the idea that the ocean is the invader or the intruder. And you have groins put in place, huge structures that run perpendicular to the shore. These groins are in place with the idea of trying to hoard up the sand for a beach that is undergoing erosion. At the same time when the groin goes in place, this does help the up coast beach, as you can see on the picture on the left, but the down coast beach undergoes even more severe erosion. As a result, you usually have a groin race taking place as the down coast owner puts in his groin and then the whole impact is goes right down the coastline. New Jersey now has over 300 groins along their shoreline in the interest of trying to combat beach erosion. However, the 
basic problem that causes the beach erosion in the first place are like structures on the right hand side, marinas and breakwaters. Most of our old ports are located in natural harbors that don't require very many harbor protective devices. But as the surge in pleasure boating has occurred, less favorable sites have been selected which require very heavy harbor protective devices. And you have jetties going out into the offshore such as this uh, structure which runs perpendicular and they're going out and they're interrupting the river of sand that constantly replenishes the beaches. And as a consequence you have harbors filling up with sand instead of water. Now over here in the left hand picture is a shot of a beach which is up coast of a marina. The action of the marina in slowing up the river of sand tends to settle out the sand and as a consequence, you have up coast beaches that balloon out. I was talking with one of the residents that lived on this beach to the left, and he said he felt like Lawrence of Arabia every time he tried to get to the shore for a swim. Usually, with a situation where the up coast beach has too much sand, the harbor has too much sand, and then the down coast beaches don't have enough, readjustment takes place. In this case, this was a down coast beach that was undergoing severe erosion. Sand was pumped down from the uh, marina to try and restore the beach. But the sand grains themselves were quickly washed away and it wasn't known at the time when the hydraulic dredge was working and pumping out behind the marina that there were large amounts of rock. So the rock was left on the shore and the people wound up with a rocky beach instead of a sandy beach. This reflects another characteristic of the natural maintenance of the shore. The littoral drift is set up to sort out sand grains so that a particular beach has a particular size sand grain equal to the surf turbulence. Consequently, when the need for restoring the beach sand becomes intense with beach erosion, the beach engineers will often go offshore to mine ancient submerged beaches or inland to mine ancient stranded beaches to restore the beach but oftentimes the sand grain isn't the right size and the erosion continues. There is another factor besides the marina construction that is working against the stability of the shore. Most of the sand that nourishes beaches in areas like California and Texas actually come from inland streams in the mountains. Here mountain boulders are ground down into chips and then the chemical and mechanical weathering action of the stream changes these strip, uh, chips into quartz and this quartz is what actually nourishes many of the beaches. Many of these streams are being dammed up now for flood control and water purposes and as a consequence the water that is impounded no longer is available to push down the sand right down to the mouth of the river. And here you have a shot of a river with a considerable amounts of sand that once replenished the beaches in California. On the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, you often have uh, considerable amounts of sand accumulate in sand dunes and then you have plants that have evolved and can withstand the salt air and can also anchor these sand dunes and stabilize them. However, developers and city councils are often prone to regard these sand dunes as likely places to level off and expand for real estate. As a consequence, the fellow who buys one of these beach homes often finds he's up against a sandstorm instead of a sand beach because the vegetative cover has been stripped. This also reduces the ability of a beach to withstand uh, severe storm tides or hurricanes because the sand reservoir has been lost through blowing wind. The U.S. coastline is about 90,000 miles long and the Corps of Engineers now estimates that over half of our coastline is undergoing various degrees of erosion. 
Because of this, it is very difficult to predict, even over the next five years, just how stable or how firm much of our shoreline is going to be. The estuarine shore is not quite as glamorous looking as the sandy shore. You don't have the cadence of the surf nor the procession of bikinis. At the same time, its rather modest look is quite deceptive because once more you have a significant meeting of natural forces. Here at the left you have a mud flat which is often regarded as a wasteland to most people. But yet, into this mud flat comes the runoff of the land carrying large amounts of, nutri of w organic waste and decaying matter. At the same time, you have the ebb and the flow of the tides coming in, and above you have the solar energy. And this coming together of natural forces produces a, a natural purification system of water in which the waste and the runoff are broken down into nutrients that generate quite a formidable chain of life. Here on the right, you can see the freshwater cattails and marsh grasses. Then to the left, you can see the marsh grass islands. Then here on the right again, you can see around the marsh grass islands, eel grass, a type of grass that is specially adapted a rooted plant to exist submerged. And around the eel grass, you have the floating plants of the sea or the plankton. So you have the great two plant systems of the planet coming together, the floating plants of the sea and the rooted plants of the land. This plant base sustains a considerable amount of wildlife. Perhaps the most dramatic representation of this wildlife are the waterfowl and shorebirds. You can get up to 40 or 50,000 shorebirds in one day in our estuarine areas that ring our coastlines. The availability of these estuarine areas is able to sustain waterfowl and shorebirds that migrate north and south across our continent throughout the seasons. The shot to the right shows an Indian midden near one of the estuarine areas in California. Because of the tremendous shellfish resources in these estuarine areas, the Indians used many of our bays as basic food sources. At the same time, these estuarine areas sustain considerable amounts of uh, fin fish. Two-thirds of our marine catch is estuarine dependent. This includes species like Manhattan, halibut, flounder, shrimp, all these type species depend on the estuarine areas either for spawning or resting or feeding. One of the problems that is now jeopardizing the existence of these estuarine areas is sedimentation. At the same time there is less beach sand reaching the shore from the mountain ranges there's considerable amounts more of silt or alluvium coming down as urbanization and industrialization upsets the vegetative cover on the flatlands and results in huge silt loads that come in down to the estuarine areas. In addition to the silt loads, the estuarine areas, because they're often regarded as wastelands, are recruited as convenient dumps for many of our solid wastes. Here on the shot on the right, you have a dump actually encroaching on an oyster bed down in the Louisiana estuarine areas. Another great impact increasing pressures on the estuarine area is this shot to the right. This is often considered one of the American dreams. Two cars in the garage and three or four boats on the front yard. However, this type of real estate pressure in the estuarine area brings together the dumpers as well as the developers in a rather horrendous situation for the estuarine area. 
The dumper has the waste that he wants to get rid of and the developer wants to reclaim the estuarine area for housing pads. So you have huge reclamation projects going on on many of our major estuarine areas. In fact, the technology that is being evolved to create this instant land is becoming quite standardized and perhaps will even have implications for the offshore because this reclaimed land can be rolled out as easily almost as laying linoleum. This type of alteration switches from a soft sloping shore to a vertical concrete shore. And this has great ramifications on the extensive wildlife resources. Oftentimes, it's claimed that there is merely a trade-off of wildlife. And this, to a certain degree, is true. But the trade-off is not what you might consider very fair, because you get are what are considered wharf assemblages of creatures in contrast to what once existed there before. The shallows, are, which are the most critical part of the estuarine area, are completely usurped and as a consequence you, the birds and the fishes and the shellfish which have evolved over centuries have their birthrights literally yanked in this trade-off. As you drive along our coast, whether it be in the Atlantic coast, the Gulf, or the Pacific coast, you, begin, you can begin to see specters of the future in which you have the hydrocarbon civilization coming right down on the coastline. Here you have the power boats, then the vertical concrete shore, the parking lot, and then a freeway behind this. Because of this intense utilization of the shore as real estate and as a transportation garage, it's very difficult to predict the condition of our fish stocks over the next five or ten years because these estuaries are vital nurseries for much of our marine catch and yet this habitat is being usurped daily. The near shore is undergoing pressures just as horrendous oftentimes as a sandy shore in the estuarine areas. Here on the right you have a shot of a common use of the ocean as a dump. Here you have an outfall coming right down on the beach. Here on the shot on the left, this was a shot of Newport Beach which I showed earlier. After it underwent severe erosion, millions of dollars was spent to haul in sand to restore the beach. But when it was restored, Inadequate sewage treatment on our nearby river created a situation in the water in which the beach had to be put under quarantine for about four or five months. As these outfall problems crop up, the reaction of the public agencies is often to extend the outfalls further out into the ocean with the feeling that the solution to pollution is dilution. Here you have a shot of a sewage outfall that is about two stories in diameter and it's going to extend about seven miles out to sea. Here you can see the ships laying the outfall. The problem here is that the creatures in the sea have uniquely adapted to the dilute nature of the seawater and that they can concentrate the nutrients in the seawater. However, they can't discriminate between what might be considered good and bad compounds. As a consequence, the sea life is beginning to concentrate items such as mercury and DDT that are coming off in the agricultural runoff as well as out of these sewage outfalls. Here you have a shot of a pelican on the California coast. The pelican is at the top of the food chain in the ocean and because of the biological magnification of many compounds that goes on in the food web, the pelican has now concentrated amounts of DDT that upset its reproductive system, result in its laying thin eggshells and now threaten it with extinction.
along with these pressures from runoff from the agricultural areas as well as the, the emptying of the sewage outfalls as well as the waste load from our rivers the nearshore area must also contend with development like this to the left this is a shot out in the Gulf Coast area this particular offshore oil platform is a mile long trucks are required in order to uh, conduct operations on this offshore platform it exhibits the prowess of technology in exploiting the ocean frontier yet at the same time this particular area is the same area that was threatened by the terrific oil spill from the Chevron oil platform that blew out early this year. The ocean is thus have to, has to contend with a technology in which there is no way of making blowouts preventable and no way of containing an oil spill once it happens. The offshore oil technology is now proliferating, not only in our country, but across the globe. And as this proliferation goes on, the chances of more oil spills occurring increases. At the same time the oceans contend with this waste load pressure, it also contends with waste load pressures from the air. Here you have a shot of an automobile, beautifully styled, yet it emits lead for out of the exhaust and this lead is settling out in the ocean. The whole chemical composition of the ocean is thus being subverted as you're getting and registering abnormal counts of lead right out in the middle of the Pacific. These pressures on the offshore and also out in the open ocean indicate how the oceans are becoming the ultimate sinks for our waste loads. And thus it's very difficult to predict the condition of the ocean or its capacity for sustaining life over the next five or ten years in the manner that it has done in the past. These type of extensive pressures on the oceans and the coastline not only affect ecology and wildlife but they also affect the public. The public owns up to the mean high tide line along the shore and that ownership is not only placed in coastal communities but extends to the entire nation. Yet when these bulkheads go up this ownership can become pretty meaningless unless you happen to be a barnacle. All up and down our coastlines there is extensive pressure to create exclusive uses of the shoreline in place of the shared use that has existed before. The concept of shared use or common use of the shoreline extends quite a ways back. In fact, the Code of Justinian proclaims, and truly by natural right, these be common to all, the air running water in the sea, and hence the shores of the sea. Nobody is therefore prohibited to come to the seashore. However, as city councils undergo pressures for developers for exclusive development, this shared use is beginning to disappear. And you're beginning to get all sorts of signs up along the coastline. Even extending to extensive military frontage which often occupies some of our best beach land in California and also on the Gulf Coast. Even the ability to use the shore is being coupled with the inability of perhaps even being able to see it. Here you have large high-rise development that is coming right down in the shore and again using the ability to see the ocean as a commodity to be marketed. In this pressure for exclusive use of the shoreline, the rewards for good management can be very slim indeed. Here to the left you have a beach that was set aside by a community 
They spent millions of dollars to acquire a sizable piece of beach frontage. At the same time, an upcoast marina threatens this beach with continual erosion. A downcoast down coast outfall puts waste pressures on it. And the increasing demand for public beach frontage requires that parking lots be built that nearly usurp the beach itself. Even a segregated wilderness approach along the coastline suffers because of the competition for the ocean and shoreline uses. Here's a shot on the right of the Carmel area where you have beautiful maritime forests coming right down on the rocky shore. This area has been set aside for a reserve. However, the waters in this reserve have been quarantined because of local sewage discharges. In fact, skin divers are advised to get hepatitis shots before they go into the waters. Because of the great appreciation that many people have had for the seashore, <clears throat> there has been some reaction from the pressures of development to try and modify or reduce the pressures. However, some of these approaches have to be looked at very carefully. left you have an oil drill island in which palms have been placed as a more or less a gesture of beautification. On the shot on the right you have a bottled water distributor setting up a water fantasy shot in a very interesting aquarium. However in the background is an estuary that is undergoing development into a real estate area. This type of Disneyland approach to the seacoast creates quite a bit of irony. You have a situation in which marine values are being glorified at the same time that they're being steadily degraded in actual practice. The problem of the coastline in the near shore is this becoming increasingly clear. It is a limited resource that is being treated as an unlimited resource with an infinite capacity for irreversible alterations. And this type of attitude creates another type of irony. We can beautify the surfboards. We can make projections about the tremendous fish catches that can be made in the ocean. We can create ingenious types of fishing rods. We can create larger and better and bigger boats. But yet there's no assurance that the natural benefits of the ocean that are to be enjoyed and exploited are going to be around for a very long length of time. We're beginning to explore deeply the potential of marine technology, but yet its horizons are shrinking because of the natural values that are being jeopardized daily. This is a shot on the left of the Lake Michigan waterfront in Chicago. This is a waterfront that has 15 parks, 15 beaches, and not one single sewage outfall. At the same time, it has a major harbor, and there's a city of six million people right besides the waterfront. The existence of such a waterfront suggests 
that the natural values of waterfront can be retained in an urban society. However, the fact that Lake Michigan's and the Chicago waterfront is about the only waterfront that has been so preserved suggests the size of the challenge in safeguarding our coastline and our coastal environment. There are two principal challenges to be met here. One is advanced waste management and the other is shared use. Chicago's original solution to waste management uh, was not quite as leadership quality that can occur now. In fact, uh, when Chicago tried to re started restoring its waterfront 50 years ago, instead of dumping into the lake, they just diverted their sewage downstream to pollute many of the river systems downstate. However, this need not be the recourse now. Here's a shot on the right of Lake Tahoe. This is a lake with unusual clarity. In fact, you can put a nine inch disc, which is called the Secchi disc by oceanographers, and you can see this 130 feet deep down into the lake. And if you have trouble appreciating this, take a Secchi disc or a nine inch diameter dinner plate or something and put it down in the Des Moines River and see how far you can see. This, is a, this lake is very dramatic in its clarity and the residents are intent on trying to keep it that way. As a consequence, they are investing in waste treatment plants that are more than just growth screens for filtering out suspended matter. Here you have a shot of the waste treatment plant and the oxygenation process where oxygen is actually in injected into the affluent to hasten the decomposition of uh, decaying matter. Here's a shot of a stripping plant that takes out the nitrogen and also that often causes enrichment problems. With this type of treatment plant, the Lake Tahoe area comes out with a type of water that is a very, very high quality. However, because they're so intent on retaining the clarity of Lake Tahoe, they have completely banned any outfalls into the lake itself. <clears throat> However, the water that comes out of this plant is such that it can be reused. So this water is piped over that mountain ridge that you see in the background. <clears throat> and it serves <clears throat> as a means of making a man-made lake. This lake is stocked with fish and rainbow trout in particular and often uh, also you can actually go swimming in this lake and you don't have to worry about the other fellow making waves. At the same time water from this lake is occasionally tapped to irrigate farmlands below the lake site. This type of water reclamation has tremendous impact in meeting some of the waste load pressures that we're faced with and in also protecting the ocean frontier. This is a shot of Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. This park was once windblown sand area and it was beautified into one of the world's greatest parks because of the landscaping. The intensive landscaping that was utilized required great amount of water. In the park landscaper, John McLaren, in order to get the amounts of water that he needed, cut into the sewage main that was emptying into the ocean, diverted the sewage into a treatment plant, and Golden Gate Park, as far as irrigation, is completely irrigated by reclaimed affluent. This suggests how coastal cities can take the waste load pressures off the offshore and at the same time gain a benefit by reclaiming and recycling the waste product. This type of advanced waste treatment also has, is being utilized by industry. This is a shot of a steel plant in Fontana, California in Southern California. Without the ability and the investment in recycling water this plant would be economical, uneconomical in an area in Southern California because of the water rates. However, by recycling, 
the water, they can be competitive in an area which traditionally has not been able to support heavy industry of this type. This dual prowess of water reclamation in reducing the waste load pressures on the offshore and at the same time making a return on the investment and treatment is going to be one of the principal chances in protecting the ocean. However, another type of uh, waste management will also have to be employed to truly protect the ocean as a living resource. You're going to, you have types of pressures that are not amendable to treatment. On the left, you have the spills and the plight that occurs when you have a blowout on an oil well or a tanker collision. The fact that oil technology is still unpredictable and uncontrollable and its impact on the environment creates a situation in which we may have a tanker, a super tanker, colliding not into a rock reef but into another super tanker and perhaps having this occur not off 20 miles offshore but right at a harbor mouth. You also have the chance that a blowout in Alaska in the Kodiak Island area may occur during a spawning run of salmon at the same time the fish fleets are assembled to catch them. There are all types of collisions that are being risked in allowing such offshore oil technology to proliferate and to adequately protect the ocean there are going to have to be sharp restrictions and even prohibitions on the type of activities that generate waste and create pressures on the ocean. The ocean's destiny as being tied to waste management really can't be underestimated because the ocean is the ultimate sink for our waste loads and the ocean is one system that cannot be flushed. With the water quality protected, investment in shared use can become more rewarding. There have been some court decisions that have great significance not only for coastal communities but for the rest of the nation that depend so heavily on the coastal areas for recreation. Here on the left you see a street easement right down to the beach which allows continued public access to the beach amid development. Recent court rulings have held that the public may hold prescriptive and customary rights of access to the shoreline, again reflecting the long historic interest in keeping the seashore a common resource. This type of shared rather than exclusive use has great ramifications because much of our coastline, the 90,000 mile length of coastline is still undeveloped and there is increasing pressure to develop it for exclusive use. Yet with proper leadership, government agencies can see that public access is maintained. There is also the opportunity to regard the shoreline as a limited resource and see that development that takes place there meets the high standards that a limited resource implies. This means that governmental bodies can actually zone out non-shore related uses such as say little league ball fields or drive-in movie houses and things of this nature and concentrate on only shore related functions. Here you have a restaurant meeting the needs of people that are coming down to the shore at the same time visual and physical access to the shore is maintained. Here in the shot on the right is a marine preserve in a rocky shore area. This is interesting because this preserve occurs in an urbanized area in the Los Angeles area. And here is a community that is determined to maintain natural values in an urban setting rather than relying on the traditional wilderness areas to withstand all the pressures. Here is an interpretative center that is going up on coastal wetlands up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Again, another instance of the determination in a particular urban community to see that natural values are maintained. 
This type of enlightened management will have great bearing on whether or not we're going to be able to actually save the nurseries of the sea. By getting balanced management into these estuarine areas, we can retain the soft sloping shore, retain its tremendous fertility, and retain its tremendous values that are generated region-wise and national-wise. There's also the chance to reopen the waterfront in our existing urban areas. Here in the shot on the left, you have a typical shot in a waterfront area in which industrial uses dominate, and the waterfront area becomes a gigantic quay and wharf area. Here on a shot on the right is a community, Vallejo, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Using urban renewal funds, they reclaimed a piece of derelict waterfront, and by putting a park there, have actually reopened the waterfront to public use. And interestingly enough, on the far side of the Bay Area, this type of park opens up a vista into the marine activities, shipbuilding and so forth, that are intrinsically interesting and create great visual interest, just as these people might come down here to go fishing, they can go down and watch the shipping activity. This type of uh, restoration work along the waterfront will have great import for cities along our coast, particularly in the east, such as New York and Baltimore and Boston. These are areas where you have millions of people living near the water's edge, and yet to enjoy the values of the water's edge, they traditionally have to go hundreds and thousand miles away. Yet by reopening the waterfront, these values can be placed right at their doorstep. At the same time, the shared use and advanced waste management provides a means of keeping the ocean alive, there is still the chance that some agencies will not exercise as broad a vision. The San Francisco Bay Area was faced with this situation in which the 90 local communities around the bay were literally determined to bury the bay in the interest of expanding the property tax base. An unusual coalition of uh, residents, of conservationists, and members of the academic community formed. Usually such coalitions are considered a rather futile form of do-goodism. However, in this case, the coalition worked very hard on persuading and informing and educating the public of the ecological dangers inherent in wholesale development of a Bay Area. And they did this often in, imagine, in uh, very imaginative ways. Here on the left, you have an example of pop art that started cropping up on the tidelands in which people that were driving by on the freeways could begin to understand what was happening to all the waste that were being dumped into the bay. At the same time, on the shot on the right, sandbags were being filled with sand and mud and being sent to city councilmen to dramatize how the bay was being slowly buried to death. This type of uh, broad scale approach in trying to persuade not only legislatures but also the citizens at large reaped a tremendous benefit. The many members of the public are becoming concerned more and more about the loss of the scenic, natural, and public values of the seashore, and they're not becoming so mesmerized by the ads that trumpet the glories of offshore oil development and subsea mining. Because many members of the public are beginning to realize that they stand to lose more by having the environment severely crippled rather than exploited wholesale. The number one oceanographic market in the country today is marine recreation. Over 100 million people spent $14 billion last year on marine recreation. And this is a precisely the type of activity in the coastal environment that is most threatened by uncontrolled development. As the coalition in San Francisco Bay made the public at large aware of this, they won increasing support. The city council still reneged on 
restraining their ambitions to fill the bay, and as a consequence, this coalition went straight to the state legislature, and they came back with a regional commission with purview over the bay, and given not only planning authority, but permit powers over fill, and also permit powers over development on the shore 100 feet inland. This is a type of environmental mechanism which places development in, within very strong environmental constraints. It's interesting to see how the ocean oftentimes has a way of imposing its character on us. Centuries ago, many nations persisted in trying to claim parts of the ocean as their own exclusive ocean. And as a consequence, you had popes and kings trying to divide up the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. After battling over this for centuries, they finally came to the conclusion that the ocean should be common and freedom of navigation should be permitted for all. This same, same type of process is now going on along in our coastal environment in which it is exhibiting the need for strong, rational management to ensure that its benefits remain for us to enjoy. Without such comprehensive management, our coastal environment and the oceans themselves will not be very pretty to look at, nor will even Scripps Institution of Oceanography or Disneyland ever be able to put it back together for us. Thank you. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Wesley Marks, author of The Frail Ocean, spoke on the topic, Can the Ocean Survive Us? University Lecture is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.